Okay, so who who's going to um, give Mark. us the summary of the argument? Overall structure, and really I wanted to talk about Hobbes as a representative. You know, he's the guy that, as far as I know, came up with this idea of the social contract, this deal that we make to be in society. And he thinks that stems directly from the nature of man. And in the introduction to the work, which we didn't read, but it was in one of the anthologies that I had, uh, that had pieces of this in it. He says that all this stuff about the nature of man is based on self-examination. It sounds very Cartesian or like early phenomenology, a word that I'm sure we will use a lot in the future, right? Which is supposed to be just a thorough description of your own experience. So he says people that figure out human nature by judging others always have very catty things to say about how, because they really think that they're superior to everybody else. But it's a skill to learn to read human nature in yourself. So he thinks th these are all things that we can independently verify by consulting our own experience. So he gets this idea of the nature of man from that, which is not a very nice nature. <laughs> and then from there goes through this series of like a mathematical treatise directly because of the nature of man. There are certain things that we do or that we should really, he, he blends those things together, but agree to, and that all builds up into, well, we agree to be in society and do whatever the king says. And that's where this part ends. And in fact, the end of the selected reading, he even says this is, a, which seems to be a completely separate point beyond this political point that other philosophers use it to mean later. He actually makes this the one and only possible ground for morality. That there is no morality outside of you know, a society in, that makes laws. Once society makes laws, then there's right and wrong. Before that, there's not. What he says is, you have this state of nature where it's basically every man against each other. And the only thing that they all have is that they all have the liberty to do whatever they can for self-preservation. And the only sort of natural law in this state is that you can't do anything which is against self-preservation. So that's the state of nature. It's, right, it's which warm. follows directly from his concept of individual human nature, that people are selfish, that we all just do whatever we can do to further our own ends, which really ends up meaning that we have to be aggressive towards others, right? Yeah, I don't think he even characterizes it as selfish. He just basically says, if you're in the state of nature, you're basically at war with everybody else for self-preservation. So you have no, there's no justice, there's no injustice, there's nothing to right or wrong. All there is is you as an individual trying to do whatever you can to preserve yourself and to, I guess, hypothetically advance yourself. So, you know, get food and and I think pro preservation, procreate. though, is just one of the motives, right? There's glory, competition, and then fear for your safety. Well, I think those those are things that would cause individuals to become aggressive towards others. But in terms of just kind of like the base layer of the state of nature, it's basically everybody for themselves for the sake of self-preservation. And then you get to this point where it's like, well, if it's just you against everybody else and somebody takes but isn't it, it in there. Isn't it more than self-preservation, though? If it's motivating the... The nastiness uh, and brutishness? Well, there, those motivations exist. But I'm talking about what he thinks is kind of like the... This is kind of going back to what Mark said about whether it's a law or not. And the, the kind of... It's basically... If you just talk about what the state is, the state is that everybody's out there just fighting for whatever they want themselves, right? right. Whatever they conceive of self-preservation. And you have a right to do that. You have a right to use whatever means necessary because there is no law at all. Right. Uh, he, he uses that word right. And before you used liberty, and the reason you were using those interchangeably is because he actually defines right as liberty. So that's very counter to the way we usually use the term, right? We usually use right as a normative term, a moral term to say it is right that you can do this thing. So I have a right to free speech means it is not okay for you to try to stop me from speaking or for the government to clamp down on my speech or something. But when he says that we have a right in nature, it's that we have the ability. It sounds like we have the liberty, we have the power to do this. Yes, and if you combine that with the other part, which is that you can't do anything to kind of self-abnegate or do something against self-preservation, it's almost like an obligation. So in the state of nature, every individual – 
has both the right but also the obligation to do whatever is necessary to preserve and further themselves. Now, the flip side of that is that you're constantly at risk. That, as Wes said, if anybody takes it into their head to take your stuff or dispossess you or kill you or whatever, you have no recourse. All you can do is fight back. And there's nothing wrong about those people doing that, right? Or is there? Yeah, this is supposed to be the limit to selfishness, that there's this picture that the proponents of capitalism, the right wing would have of, you know, this greed is good. Hey, yeah, we, we can all just work for our own ends and we can all just happily coexist. But that wouldn't happen in a state of nature because somebody is going to be aggressive. And so even if you're stronger than other people, they can gang up on you. You're always going to be at risk. And even if you're not actively fighting with somebody, the fact of the matter is because there's no law, because there's no right or wrong, because there are no structures, you're constantly going to be brought into a state of conflict over one thing or another, whether it's resources right. or opinions or, or whatever. You could call it a state of paranoia. And, and <laughs> one of the things that Hobbes mentions is that the definition of your own conservation becomes broader than you might think it would. So in other words, you start thinking about preemptive strikes and yep, yep. I've got to control other people or else they can hurt me. And all of these things are allowable. Gain as much power as you can because otherwise it could be the end of you if you don't do everything you can. So. No, that's a really good point. It's that you can never be secure unless you are completely dominating everything around you, right? There could be nobody within a thousand miles. You might not sleep comfortably at night because you never know when somebody might show up and take your cattle, right? Or something along those lines. Right. I think from this question of whether we think there's any morality here and this idea that man has a right in the state of nature to do what he wants to to anyone else, I think there is in a sense because this idea of self-preservation and the importance of self-preservation is in a way its own fundamental moral commandment. And the idea is that outside of society, that commandment sort of runs amok and yet it still has its own fundamental moral force. We'll probably want to come back to that, Wes, a little bit later, but he does talk about the difference between, say, a rule of reason and a law and kind of right. it, that if you're rational and you kind of look at this, it only makes perfect sense that you wouldn't want to be in that state. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that that's the foundation of the moral philosophy are these rules of reason that just basically say, if your number one impulse is towards self-preservation and you exist in this state of war where everybody is fighting in this paranoia and dominating each other just for self-preservation, that actually your impulse to self-preservation would lead you to try to create a compact or a contract with somebody else. In other words, to take yourselves out of this state of war so that you weren't constantly paranoid and fighting for resources right. and so forth. And, you know, he basically says... This is like a rule of reason. It only makes sense that you would want to do that and that that's kind of the foundation of his moral philosophy. And at one point he right. kind of throws this out where he says, of course, if you believe that that is given to us, delivered by the word of God, then it becomes a law. <laughs> so kind of like, right. oh, okay, well, you know, to play it how it lays. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that the sort of do unto others principle, that there are two versions of it, and it depends on context. The, the idea of the moral foundation being the golden rule makes sense within society, but when you do away with that context, it reverts to do unto others everything that they might do unto you and do it before they do it. <laughs> so, um, are, are you saying Hobbes is committed to some version of the golden rule? He explicitly talks about them. Isn't that not how his political view pans out, that we all give up our freedom because the state of nature is terrible, so it only makes sense that we would want to give up our freedom to be part of a society and to obey the ruler. And so from then on, the ruler is who determines what's right and wrong, and he can't abridge our, our liberty so far as to, if he says, I'm going to kill you now, then we are not obliged to lay down and die. But that's the only thing that we retain is this right to defend ourselves. Right. So it doesn't become the golden rule. He could have great disparate, uh, you know, high class and a low class and all sorts of 
what we would call injustices written into law. But as long as, you know, that's what the ruler says and the ruler is what's keeping us all from it, descending into a state of nature, I then think it's the okay. golden rule, though, is itself purely pragmatic, right? It's, I don't want to get hurt, so I'm not going to hurt. That makes sense only within the context of an enforcer, an overarching authority. It doesn't work in nature. And I forget what law it is, but he does explicitly trot that out, I think, as one of the laws. You know where that is, Seth? Or? Yeah, I think one of the key points is that Mark sort of skipped a step there, and that is that, so we're in this state of nature, and, and the three of us are at war, and we're concerned about our security and our safety, so we're constantly scheming and conniving against each other. Could I just read the famous quote here, that life in this situation is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I actually think you should read the full sentence because I, I absolutely, to me, that was, it's beautiful. I love it. What a lot of fun. All right. I'll, I'll try to make this sound poetic. Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war where every man is enemy to every man, the same consequent to the time where men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain. And consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving or removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, <laughs> which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. All right. You know that's the opening voiceover to Conan the Barbarian, by the way. I, actually, at the beginning part of that, Mark sounded a lot like that guy who does the voiceovers for the movies. Yeah, exactly. In a time of war, a land divided seeks a king. <laughs> you know, that kind of... But don't you think that he's kind of driving at something here, where if you buy in this premise that without society, basically everybody's out there fighting for themselves, he's describing this thing where you can't create the arts. You don't build buildings. You don't you know, sow the ground and create agriculture. You don't, there's no science, right? Because there's no security. There's no certainty that you won't be, you know, overrun or abused or dispossessed or what have you. And if you buy that premise that that's the way things are in the state of nature, it's a strong motivation to get out of that. Don't you think? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so basically, you know, this idea that if I'm in this state where I have never have security and I'm, I can't do anything, I can't further anything. So in order to, to gain security, I'm going to go to Wes and I'm going to say, hey, Wes, why don't you and I make a pact? We'll agree not to steal each other's stuff and trespass on these lands and so on and so forth, that we're basically mutually sacrificing some bit of this liberty, mm -hmm. this false liberty, which is really just unbounded kind of self-interested action for the sake of security. So at least I know that on the border where Wes lives, you know, I don't have to put up a gate or a fence or post guards or dots or whatever. That, that makes perfect sense. Just a screen so you don't have to look at him. That is, by the way, the second law and the one that I'm sort of relating to the golden rule, that a man be willing when others are so too as far forth as for peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down his right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow now, other men against himself. The problem is, and this kind of bridges to Mark's earlier point, is that he does acknowledge that there's no way to guarantee that you'll keep your word. So if I enter into this agreement with Wes, I have no guarantee that Wes will keep his word, which is why you need this external third party to enforce Hence, you need some sort of civil authority to enforce it. That's the chain right. of reasoning. You're in war. You get out of war because you want security, but you can't really right. rely on the other guy to do what he says. So there's got to be somebody else that you can trust who can enforce the rule between you. And that enforcement is twofold. On the one hand, it's religion. And on the other, it's the monarch or the worldly authority. Interestingly, of course, he relates them, you know, the whole idea of swearing on the you know, which is another interesting point, the extent to which everything that we know about the law is grounded in much of what Hobbes is saying, which probably comes from English common law. But the whole idea of swearing on a Bible, sort of inserting the spiritual threat into what is otherwise, you know, merely an enforcement by the king or by the legal system and so on and so forth. 